So firstly, uh, uh, thanks to Riddhi, Arvind, and Manju for organizing this uh, wonderful meeting. Uh, this is my second visit to ICTS. Uh, it's a wonderful place. So almost, I can't compare the nature uh, with Oberolfak, but it's kind of still, uh, one can say it's the Oberolfak of India in the sense that the amount of conferences and uh, workshops, uh, good workshops, which are being held here. So yeah, it's always a pleasure. And uh, so today uh, I'll be talking about random interface models. Uh, I wish to talk about the PDE approach. Uh, generally in my talks, I'm so, uh, I cannot reach this PDE approach uh, before one hour. So uh, I decided for, uh, like I'm giving a Slack talks after a long time, I generally give uh, talks. Uh, so this is a joint work with uh, Alessandra Cipriani from uh, TU Delft and uh, Bill to uh, Dan, who is a student, PhD student at ISI Kolkata. So it's a part of his, uh, uh, so presently he's pursuing the PhD fourth year, so it's a part of his thesis. So uh, uh, this talk is split, uh, split into these parts. First, I'll uh, describe some examples of uh, interface models. Uh, then I'll say what do I mean by scaling limits. So mainly I'll be concentrating on uh, the la integer lattice ZD, and uh, I'll let the lattice spacing go to uh, zero, and it will converge to the continuum. So I want to see how the interfaces beha behave when we converge to continuum. So how is the thermodynamic limits behaving? Uh, so the, I'll describe what the sub subcritical dimensions are. There will be a quantitative and qualitative uh, difference between subcritical dimensions and critical and supercritical dimensions. And finally, uh, I'll tell the approach uh, in which we are, uh, we are tackling this problem. So what is a random interface? We already heard in the morning lecture. So uh, in the morning lecture, we were looking at for example, each point in the lattice had an integer height. So integer height s here, so we are considering real heights. So, for, so we are considering r powers d is just is the set of functions from zd to the real line. So one thinks of this collection phi x, which I'll always uh, look for. Uh, so what is phi x doing? For each point in the lattice, we are assigning a real variable phi x, which indicates the height of the, uh, so height of the interface at a point x. And what we'll be considering is on such a class of heights, we'll be putting a probability measure. And this probability measure will be driven by, uh, so the interface will be driven by something called an energy, uh, which is given by an Hamiltonian. So more mathematically, what we'll look into is behavior of this probability measure on this space, which looks like e power minus the Hamiltonian by z lambda. z lambda is just the partition function which makes the total measure to be one. So, so we'll, our probability measures uh, will be of the form e power minus h phi. And what is d phi x? d phi x is the Lebesgue measure. So it's the induced Lebesgue measure from the real line. And you have, so what you do is, so you take lambda to be a finite box on Z. So lambda will generally be, for example, uh, minus N power D, or even like of these form. So we'll consider finite sets, uh, finite boxes uh, in the integer lattice. And on the finite boxes, we'll put this probability mass which, and we assign a boundary condition, which is uh, outside the box, we let the field to take the values phi x, uh, psi x. Uh, for this talk, we'll always assume that psi x is zero. So it's a, it's a zero boundary condition. So outside the box, the field takes the value zero. So we won't go into general boundary conditions. There, uh, uh, there are much, many issues which come up on general boundary conditions. So we won't uh, go into them. Okay, so now this is, uh, we have to describe what the Hamiltonian is. For this talk, uh, we'll concentrate on 
three examples. So three types of Hamiltonians we'll consider. The first one is the most popular one. Uh, in mathematics, uh, we call it the uh, discrete Gaussian free field, DGFF in short. So it arises out of the Dirichlet energy. So how does the Hamiltonian look like? Uh, there is a rescaling by 1 by 4D, and then you sum over X in ZD of del nabla phi X. Nabla is the gradient. Now gradient here means the discrete gradient. The discrete gradient I would just denote by this vector where each of these is the partial derivative, is the discrete partial derivative. So phi phi x minus phi x plus ei. Ei is just the neighbor. So for example, ei, so 1, 0, or 0, 1 into dimension. So these are the basis vectors of these. So these are the small increments we are looking at. So this is the gradient. And you take the gradient square. So if you expand it, so we just learned the notation that you expand it. X sim y means uh, you sum over all the y's which are neighbors of x. And uh, I guess, uh, OK, I'm missing a sum. You have a sum over zd. So I'm, I'm missing a sum. Sorry. So it's a, so I, OK, so it's a sum over zd and then sum over x. So let me write down sum over x in zd. Then for every neighbor in y, you consider phi y minus phi x whole square. So this is also called the grad phi model. Or this is, uh, in physics literature, like uh, this is like the lattice version of the uh, Euclidean massless bosonic field. Uh, and if you expand this square, so you see there is a square here, phi phi x minus phi y square, and do some juggling with the uh, summations here, what you can show that this Hamiltonian looks like phi x minus the graph Laplacian applied to phi x, which I write now as an inner product. So there's a reason I'm writing this as an inner product between phi minus Laplacian phi uh, with the, just the, this is the little l2 of zd. So, and Laplacian is the standard Laplacian, but uh, from Levine's lecture, uh, so he needed integers, so, but I don't need integers here, so I'm just rescaling by 1 by 2d there. So now, so the Hamiltonian has a form that it's an inner product between phi and minus Laplacian acting on phi. Now, so this is one of the, so one sees that, so since our measures looks like e power minus h phi, so the configuration, so, or the, uh, oh, points in omega which are favored by these probability measures are like flat configurations where the gradient is zero. So gradient is zero. So this, this is a model which kind of favors the flat configuration. Now this is another model which is the membrane model. So this is used in the uh, in, uh, many semi-flexible membranes. So in the biophysics literature this is used uh, in the semi-flexible membranes and uh, also in polymer models. This is one model which takes the curvature into account in the sense that what is the Hamiltonian look like? So the Hamiltonian now, so let us concentrate on the inner product. Previously, it was just phi minus Laplacian phi. Now you have phi Laplacian square phi. So Laplacian square, I would always mean that Laplacian applied on Laplacian. So you are applying it twice. So this is this operator changes here, the Laplacian changes to the Laplacian square, the B Laplacian, it's also called the B Laplacian. And this favors, so as you can see, uh, so when the Laplacian phi x is zero, the Hamiltonian, like, uh, like it favors flat hypersurfaces where a point is same as its neighboring heights. A point is same as its neighboring heights. And so, so if it's, uh, if it's favoring flat hypersurfaces, you're like you're penalizing the bending. So if your surface has more bending, you try to penalize that. So this is kind of uh, one of the models uh, in semi-flexible membranes which was proposed. And interestingly, so like uh, uh, in the afternoon lecture, uh, Violetta will also talk about how this model uh, arises even in sand piles also in some, some uh, modifications of sand piles where this arises. So another model is the mixture of the two. 
where you, you both have Laplacian and the B Laplacian. In the sense that you are, so you have a kappa one, uh, nabla phi x squared, which was the DGFF part, and you have the membrane part. Both, the, both are there, but you have a constants now. These are, uh, kappa one is called the lateral tension, and kappa two is the bending rigidity. Both, uh, like one is, so these are not no, my nomenclatures, so these are like uh, used nomenclatures. But interestingly, what turns out that you are in a finite system. For example, here you have the box. These kappa one, kappa two uh, in the experiments might turn out to depend on n also. So they are, they, are, they are dependent on, sometimes they are dependent on the polymer length you are taking, or so, so there is an n dependency in them. So first we'll see what happens uh, when kappa one and kappa two are exactly constants, and also when it depends on n. Some, there is a, some kind of a interesting phase transition which happens, so this is kind of a very recent findings. We didn't expect such a phase transition to happen, but there is a phase transition in the large scale behavior we'll, uh, we'll, uh, we'll find out. So these are the three models. So DGFF, membrane, and this mixed model where you have mixed interaction are the three models we'll focus on today. Any questions on the uh, models? Okay. It's just a parameter. Like, like here, I'm missing one parameter, if you see. The, uh, there is one parameter which always comes in, it's the inverse temperature. I'm not talking anything about inverse temperature because I'll just point out these models turns out to be Gaussian. When you write the, you know, uh, the Hamiltonian in that form, and you can get rid of uh, this inverse temperature because we'll be only interested in scaling limits. So additivity, additivity in which sense uh, it's a, it's, a, it's a, like if you think of it as an operator, this one, this as a discrete operator, it's still additive in that sense, but I, I don't, I'm not getting, maybe I come back to you later, but I'm not getting your question perhaps, uh, yeah. Okay, maybe I, I talk to you later about it, I'm not getting your question. So, so as you saw, the Hamiltonian has a general form. So what is the general form uh, here is that you have phi and LD of phi, LD from omega to omega is a nice operator which acts of the form phi D, uh, LD acting on phi x is summation of C alpha phi x plus alpha. Now, I'm not specifying what the C alphas are. You can choose your favorite C alphas. For example, you take one neighbors, two neighbors. So, for example, when you take a bi Laplacian, so Laplacian generally needs, so F x is summation of y c max, f y minus f x. So Laplacian generally depends on a point and its neighbors. The bi Laplacian depends not only its, on its neighbors, also on the second neighbors, neighbors of neighbors. And this kind of brings in a further complicacy in the model. Uh, for, example, uh, for example, if you look at the Markov properties and all these things, so there is a bit of technical uh, problems which arise in them. But these kind of operators, so these C alphas uh, will be mostly zero, except maybe when you take alpha to be the first neighbor or the second neighbor in my example. So these are of the form this. So now this is like reminiscent of the continuum elliptic operator, which looks like this. You have LF to be a, for a nice function F, you have some symbols A, beta, gamma, which are symmetric over beta and gamma. And then you have the derivative operator, so D beta, is uh, for a multi-index beta one, beta two, is just uh, you apply consecutive to the partial derivatives, d beta gamma f. So this is kind of the discrete analog of an elliptic operator you have. So, and you have three elliptic operators we'll be considering in the talk. One is the Laplacian, another is the biharmonic, and another one is the mixture of the two. Uh, one can generalize also, like, there are no reasons, but like these symbols sometimes like, it's a two-parameter symbol sometimes. So otherwise, it's, a, uh, it, uh, it's a not necessary. But sometimes these symbols kind of depend on, like, whether you, you split it up just to bring in the symmetry in the, in the model, like uh, self-adjointness in the, in the operators. Just, uh, just L1, just uh, L1. Some, some of beta 1 to beta m, like that, you do. 
Okay. So I'll, I'll not be talking about more general forms, but this is, I just want to say that this kind of Hamiltonians is a more a part of a general class of models. And uh, uh, not much theory is known in the discrete case. Even in the discrete case, we saw, so uh, we are aware that, for example, if you take the graph Laplacian, it is related to many uh, networks and other things uh, where you can use the electrical network theory. This theory isn't developed for, for example, if you take just uh, uh, an elliptic operator. So it's not very well known in, the, in that sense. Okay, so, so if we take one of those favorite models under positive definiteness of this operator, so what you can show that, firstly, you have zero boundary conditions. Outside the box, you are zero. And inside the box, you are like a Gaussian random variable with covariance given by what I call G lambda, it's the Green's function. So G lambda is, so the covariance of this Gaussian variables, so these, these are mean zero, and the covariance is given by the Green's function. And what is the Green's function? So Green's function uh, is, is the fundamental equation, uh, is the fundamental solution of this uh, elliptic operators we consider. So LD, so if you fix a X in lambda, LD of G lambda x y is just delta uh, x at y, so it's one, and G lambda x y is zero when y is outside. So this is because the second line is because of the zero boundary conditions. So formally, what I can do is I can write the G to be delta inverse, because this is like, and if you look at in the matrix form, this is just L D G is identity. So so this is like uh, uh, the formal notion that G is delta inverse. Now this G has nice form when you consider the DGFF. So it's given by, so for example, if you consider the lattice, so G lambda XY is, you take a random walk on ZD. You look at the expected number of visits starting at X, the number of visits to Y before you exit the box. Before you get your walk gets killed, you look at the number of points, uh, number of times you visit y, starting from x. So this is the killed Green's function, and uh, it has a nice random walk representation. And uh, this is nice in the sense uh, we know lots about random walks. That's why we are much comfortable if there is a link between random walk and these discrete PDs, and uh, it helps in our analysis. But in membrane or mixed, so when you consider the G lambda, there are no random walk representation. And there, like, it's, a, it's one of the biggest hurdles that you cannot use the random walk theory uh, in principle there. Why in principle? Uh, that, that comes to my next slide. So, so you ask the next question, that you have a, so you have a probability measure, P lambda, on this, uh, boxes. So what if your lambdas, so if you take the boxes, they increase to ZD, can you say where this probability measure weakly converges to? So that's the next question, and the answer depends on dimension. Why dimension? So for example, this Green's function, like if you look at, so in two dimension you know the random walk uh, is recurrent, and in three dimensions or more it's transient. So what you can do is you can let this lambda go to uh, ZD. So this would, and you can remove the constraint that you hit the box. So your box is going to, blowing off to infinity. So this sum would still convert. So G, ZD of XY would be a finite quantity. And it would be a positive definite. It would give you a nice Gaussian measure with that infinite covariance, GZD. So does that same thing hold for membrane or uh, mixed model? Yes, it holds. And you have nice random walk representation for this infinite volume. So, but, so the question is, again, I repeat, so uh, does there exist a probability measure P on this omega r power zd such that P lambda weakly converges to P as lambda increases to, as the boxes increases to zd? So now we're look, looking at this operator kappa 1 and kappa 2. So kappa 1, so first consider the Laplacian case we just saw. So this has an infinite volume P if the dimension is greater than three, when you are transient. 
when you are transient. The next case is purely membrane. You don't have the Laplacian part. Then it's dimension greater than five. So and the and the G is given by the convolution. So this is like the discrete convolution of the Green's function you had in the first uh, DGFF case. In fact, like if you just juggle around with that sum, uh, you can show show a nicer form also. So suppose. Uh, So suppose you start random walks from x and y, so two independent random walks from x and y on the lattice, and you look at the number of times these two intersect. They form, th that's precisely this convolution I have written. It's just you have to write it down and split it up. So, so one can think of where is membrane coming into picture here. So in the original DGFF, you had just the random walk paths. In the membrane, you have intersections. So there is a part which is kind of inherent in this membrane models, which is you have to look at intersections of paths. And this was, so there was a recent work by uh, Lawler, Soon, and Wu, who put some height functions on uh, uniform spanning forest, and they showed that the limit is membrane model. So one of the crucial thing was that you have to look at intersections between uh, loop erased random walk and a simple random walk. Two independent, uh, a simple random walk independent of a loop erased random walk, look at intersections. And then they showed that the limit is membrane. So this was kind of hidden inside their model also. When, so there is a discrete model where there is some kind of intersection. So I just want to point out that in, for example, we did some computations with uh, uh, sand piles. We didn't find this explicitly. But maybe there is some hidden, uh, hidden thing. In the mixed case, uh, there, is a, there is a massive, uh, there is a mass coming into the Green's function, which is, so gamma kappa is given by one plus kappa m plus one, and then you have the same transitions, and you have a, a, a convolution of the gamma kappa. That is also easy to explain here. For example, G was this. So your operator was like, kappa times uh, minus Laplacian plus Laplacian square, whole inverse. So what you do is, so kappa minus Laplacian, uh, so you take minus Laplacian common, then this is minus kappa plus, or kappa plus minus Laplacian, and whole inverse, the whole inverse of this thing. So this gives the Green's function, and this gives a massive Green's function in the sense that there is a mass kappa in, in here. And that mass kappa, <coughs> that, that mass kappa appears in this thing. And this is invertible in the infinite volume. Uh, you don't have to bother about the boundary conditions of the finite volume. This is not true in the finite volume. This is not true in the finite volume. So you cannot get a representation uh, for G lambda like this in the finite volume. Okay, so uh, infinite volume case, I won't be looking much into it. So what I'll consider now, from now on, I'll consider only the finite volume case, which is the more difficult one here, because it doesn't have a random walk representation. Uh, and, and there are certain more things. For example, the Green's function also takes negative values. So somehow the FKG also fails here. So there are, uh, so it has, it can have negative correlations. So, so there is another problem. So one is the random walk representations, and another is the correlations can take uh, negative values also. So now we go to the question when, uh, so when we consider scaling limits. So what are we doing in principle? So we have a box. So we consider spacings of the form one by n of this, and we let, so we have a, so we have say, E lambda n, which we'll also denote by n here. So it's a n cross n box, so minus n to n. And then we look at the uh, membrane or mixed model on these uh, points, and then we let n go to infinity. So the lattice size, so this one by n zd intersection lambda uh, or a 
uh, Lambda converges to a domain in, in R power D. So you, your lattice converges to a domain in R power D. So dimension one is interesting in the sense that uh, it turns out that all the limit measures you get have continuous path. So it's a one dimensional thing. So you are looking at a trajectory and the trajectory turns out to be in the limit to be continuous. So how do we, like what is the statement like we see? So this is phi was uh, our interface model. You look it at the uh, phi of nt, so you want to make a linear interpolation like this. Just like you, uh, just like you lin uh, linearly interpolate the random walk paths to converge to Brownian motion, you do the same linear interpolation here. So this is just for a linear interpolation, so that phi and t, phi and hat t turns out to be a continuous function. Uh, you do this uh, quantity. So the result says for DGFF or the mixed model, so uh, mixed model I mean I will take the kappa one and kappa two both to be one, here just for simplicity, otherwise there are some constants coming. Uh, I won't talk about the dependency on n, so no n here, so kappa one, kappa two are exactly equal to one. Then in C01, C01 is the space of all continuous functions with the uniform uh, metric. So in C01, if you rescale this paths by n to the power minus half, it converges to the Brownian bridge. The Brownian bridge is the Brownian motion conditioned to be at zero when uh, uh, t is one. So it's the Brownian. And this, in DGFF, this is well known. So this is not our result. In DGFF, this is uh, pretty well known in the sense that if you uh, write down the Hamiltonian, if you just expand the Hamiltonian, you can show that the measure has the same distribution as the random walk bridge. And then you just, the random walk bridge would converge to the Brownian bridge, and then you get the result. For membrane, if you see, mem uh, or the mixed model, you have two interactions. So it's kind of, you don't have the random walk bridge in the, directly in the limit. So, so, so this requires a bit more work. Finally, the random walk bridge comes, but like uh, it's a more technical work. So this was this model in dimension one in the mixed case was uh, first studied by uh, Karavena and Borechki uh, uh, in 2011, and uh, they studied a different question about the free energy of the system. So this kind of gives the first result that the mixed model when you take the kappa one and kappa two to be one, it converts to the Brownian bridge. Membrane, I just want to indicate uh, that there is something interesting happens in membrane uh, in dimension one. Uh, so if you take, for example, xi to be iid normal zero one and you consider the random walk, then you consider zn to be some of these random walks. So y1 plus yn, so you can write it as n times x1 plus n minus one times x2. So this is a random walk, and this is also called an integrated random walk. Then one can show that the membrane model, if you look at the measure of the membrane model, then this turns out to be the measure of integrated random walk with the conditioning that yn, zn, both at the end on the boundary, they are zero. And this, this is quite, so this is, uh, this integrated random walk is interesting because it also came uh, previously in works of Sinai and everything uh, where uh, uh, there was, uh, uh, there is a lot of literature in, uh, uh, in, in the pinning literature, there is uh, lots of work here. And so as you can guess now, so this is, the name suggests that there is an integration involved. So, so let BT be the Brownian motion and IT be the integral of the Brownian motion, zero to T, B S, D S, and you define B hat and I had to be the BT, IT, conditioned to be at one, B1, I1 is zero. So this is, you have to always do the conditioning because there is a zero boundary condition. Your field like suddenly becomes zero, so you have, always have to do a conditioning on, on these processes. And why you have to consider it jointly? Because there is again a, a little bit issue with the two boundary conditions I, I talked about that the B Laplacian depends on it's, it doesn't have that Markov property. So, so it's better like when you consider it jointly, there is a Markov, Markovian property involved in it. And uh, this was the result, you again consider the linear interpolation. 
in C01 if you rescale by n to the power 3 by 2. So previously in DGFF or the mixed model, you had n to the power minus half, which is the standard random walk scaling. Here you have n to the power 3 by 2 because you are in the integrated random walk. So you are, you are, you are adding up one more n in your variance uh, in the integrated random walk case. So this is n to the power 3 by 2. If you rescale, then you consider, so you have the conditioned integrated random walk as the limit. And there are, so this was, uh, this was derived by Caravena and Doshel in a much more general uh, setup where you have, uh, you have a pinning membrane model uh, in 2009. Uh, they described like uh, much, in much more generality on what happens in this. But this was after that, like nothing was known in higher dimension. Because in higher dimension, you don't have this nice representation of the random walks. So, but as we saw, like, so what's the critical dimension? So what we said, the infinite volume for the membrane exists for d greater than 5, equal to 5. So d is equal to 4, we call that to be the critical. And d is equal to 2, 1, 2, and 3 are still subcritical. So what we saw in the subcritical case, in dimension 1, you have continuous paths. So there is a natural kind of whether the, in dimension two or three, we also have continuous paths or not. Now, uh, it turns out to be true. So what you do is you again take the membrane model uh, in dimension two and three, and you rescale by this factor, d minus four by two. So if d is one, you see you get minus three by two. So if you rescale this uh, field by one by two, and you have to look at the field continuously. In one dimension, you can do a linear interpolation. In two and three dimension, you have to be a bit careful about what kind of interpolation you are choosing because you have to do a continuous interpolation. So uh, it's, uh, it kind of happens that like you can do it. So for example, if you think of this part, that if you have a point here, you can write it as a, uh, in terms of the barycentric coordinates, or uh, these three, and then you define the field inside in terms of these coordinates. And then that turns out to be a nice continuous interpolation uh, of the field. So, the, so in this case, it turns out to be that d2, 3, uh, if you take uh, the domain to be minus 1, 1 to the power d, then this interpolated field, uh, psi n, converges uh, weakly to psi, where psi turns out to be a Gaussian process. So it's a centered Gaussian process. Uh, it has continuous paths. The covariance is given by the Green's function of the continuum, so the Green's function of the continuum Dirichlet problem for the bi-Laplacian. Now this is already a bit tricky because uh, if you look at the bi-Laplacian literature, uh, it was like for 40 years there was very, very less works about how the Green's function behave, especially for like boxes like this when you have corners. When you have smooth domains, still you can say, but it's like it already falls in a critical question in PD. When when can you like how is the asymptotics of the GD XY behave when you have domains with uh, corners or something like that? But uh, there was remarkable achievement in like uh, last uh, six seven years by uh, Vladimir Mazia and uh, then uh, uh, Mazia and. Uh, Maya Boroda. So, so, so they uh, did a lot of work in this. So, so now people know a bit about it. And this D is, so what you do is you fix an X and you look at the derivative in each of the uh, coordinates in Y. So this is D Y1, Y2, if you are in uh, looking at the two dimension. So this is the Dirichlet problem uh, for the bi Laplacian in uh, the continuum. And uh, so this is, this is the only thing we can say about the limiting process, not much. There, for example, we had an explicit representation. Here we are lacking that explicit representation, but still there are informations because we know how the Green's function behave. So you have a continuous process whose paths you, uh, you know are continuous, and you, you know the covariance. An upshot of the proof is that you can prove that the paths are holder continuous with even exponent eta, where eta lies between 0 and half in d is equal to 2, 
and uh, so eta lies between 0 and 1 in d is equal to 2 and 0 and half in d is equal to 3. And since you have convergence in the C01 space of the continuous paths, you can use a continuous mapping theorem to say how does the maximum behaves for these fields in dimension 2. So what you can show that the maximum converges to the supremum of these processes. It's a, it's a exercise we always do after doing the random walk convergence that the uh, maximum of the random walk converges to the supremum of the Brownian bridge. So it's, it's, a, it's a similar kind of exercise which gives you the supremum of psi x. Now why this is interesting because uh, the extremes of membrane is already a bit challenging. In d greater than 5, uh, when the infinite volume exists, there were some uh, we developed with uh, Chiarini and Alessandra, we developed uh, uh, Stein's method way to deal with this. Uh, but the dimension 4 is, turns out to be extremely difficult. So the Rishidip is here, so in his thesis he could prove a re, if you take the maximum and you recenter that by the expected maximum, they turn out to be tight. And, and that's, uh, that's the present status. So people would like to know whether the maximum or even the point process based on these uh, fields behave like the log correlated models. Because it turns out to be that in dimension 4, there is the correlation behaves in a logarithmic fashion. So there is, in dimension 4, the model behaves almost similar to the model of DGFF in dimension 2. So there is a log correlated uh, thing. So, but this is a, uh, a big open problem, and one of the hurdles is that the what doesn't know how the Green's function behaves uh, in D is equal to four more properly. So you don't know the exact expansion of the Green's function, how how good it is. So, brief idea on the proof: finite dimensional uh, convergence follows from the Green's function convergence. Yeah. This yeah. uh, the, uh, the tail of this thing I, I cannot tell. Like it's a it's a very it's a very good question, uh, but uh, the information we have is just the covariance asymptotics, and uh, that doesn't immediately give you how the tail exponent of this uh, this random variable behaves. Uh, it's a it's a bit difficult uh, to answer immediately. Like how it it will have moments, but you cannot say like like how explicitly the tail would behave or, so one can show that it has moments, but uh, that's it, I think. It's a supremum of continuous Gaussian process. It will have Gaussian tails, but like it's a, it's a correlated process, so uh, it will, it, it's definitely a Gaussian process, it's a supremum of a Gaussian process, definitely. That's, that's, uh, that's, that's true, that's true. That's uh, true what Manju said, that it's a supremum of a Gaussian process. Because it has continuous paths, and you're taking the supremum, it's a, just a supremum of a Gaussian process. I don't know like what information more you can gather up uh, from there uh, for it. Any more questions? Huh? That, that, uh, the greater than 5, it's explicit because like you have a Gumbel distribution. You can explicitly identify in the d greater than 5, it's a explicit that it's a standard Gumbel because what you have, the correlations go to 0 for the membrane model. So although there is a long range dependency in the model, but they go to 0 pretty fast, so you are quite close to the IID structure, I, if you take IID Gaussians. So that kind of helped, that, that behavior kind of helped here. And d is equal to 4, you are expected to converge to something which the DJFF converges, uh, the shifted gumbel. So just a brief idea, so we check. Uh, so just to point out, I won't go into details. Uh, so you have to check like the covariance estimates for the processes. And that's not entirely easy because of the lack of the Green's function. And we were saved kind of, we were approaching in the same way, but in uh, December uh, 2017, Muller and Schweiger uh, came up, when we were calculating that, they came up with a big paper, so that kind of saved our paper in the sense that it took away 60 pages of calculations. So uh, they, they kind of got very precise estimates or gradient bounds on the Green's function. So why does the gradient bounds come? Just to flash you that. So when you expand this, 
you can write it in terms of the discrete gradients. When you expand the covariance, you can write it in terms of discrete gradients. This is just juggling, plus, minus, and all these. So what you need is a bound on the discrete gradients, if you, if you have two points and neighbors. Otherwise, what you do, you take a nearest neighbor path from two points to another, and you just sum over these finite paths, all these patches, and then you are done. So, uh, and what Muller and Schweiger did was they got a very precise kind of estimate for these gradient bounds on the Green's function. Uh, so even in the continuous case, that's kind of extremely difficult to derive. But they, they managed to do it uh, with an extremely precise bound. And uh, yeah, and, uh, and that kind of like is helping the subject in developing now. The, those bounds are really helping in getting other questions answered, like entropic repulsion, pinning, and other things. So, so it's a great improvement in that sense. Now what happens in the critical and supercritical dimension? Uh, uh, so, so again, so this is the interesting case. Uh, what you do is you consider the membrane model. So here, again, as I said, it depends, this model depends, so we'll concentrate on the membrane model, because that's the kind of prototypical model we have, and not much is known. So what you do is, you start with a bounded domain with a smooth boundary. I'll, I'll tell you like what, how far you can relax the boundary, and you take a discretization of the boundary, and you define this set RH. RH is what, you take all the points in the discrete lattice, such that the two neighbors, so a point and its two neighbors all lie within the domain. So this will be our domain where we consider the membrane model. So lambda n is just the blow up of this model on ZD. So pictorially, so I, I don't know whether the colors are visible. So there are some orange colors and the green colors. So green colors, so you have a domain which is the black circular surface. Then you have the lattice on that. What you consider is the membrane model on this green region, so that all the points don't go out of the out of the boundary. It's a it's a technical issue, but uh, like it helps in our computation somehow because you are inside the domain, you are, don't have to extend it otherwise. Now, what you do is uh, so you take a smooth function C C infinity, and you define psi h acting on f to be this form that phi of x plus x by h, uh, fx. So this is just action of the field on a function, test function. So you can think of that psi h acts on cc infinity function. And one can show that, for example, this psi h lives in the dual of, so they are distributions. Psi h itself is a distribution. So the question is, where does this psi h converge to? Now what is happening, why do we expect this? Because this is kind of a bit of a standard in this uh, literature in the sense that uh, when you are in this, so you have a critical dimension, which is four. So you have continuous paths here. So you have continuous functions on the domain. Then what you do is you jump from the L2 to, so you have the CC infinity function somewhere lying there. And then you jump from uh, functions to distributions. These are, these are no longer functions. You have to look into the limit as distributions. So you can think of distributions such as tempered measures and all these things. So, what, so here the question is, where does this psi x converge to? Now for describing what the limit is, I go to the spectral theory. I describe the spectral theory for only two of the, uh, so delta c is the continuum Laplacian, so m indicates that when m is 1, it's the standard Laplacian. And when m is 2, it is the bi-Laplacian. What one, the spectral uh, theory says that you have eigenfunctions, u1, u2, uh, it goes to infinity of this Laplacian. And you have correspondingly eigenvalues, lambda 1 to lambda n, uh, positive, which goes to infinity, such that these eigenfunctions form an orthonormal basis of L2. For each j, you can show that these eigenfunctions are uh, smooth, uh, that's elliptic regularity. And finally, what we need is, one of the crucial is the while asymptotics. So while asymptotics, thankfully, like there is a paper by Beals, uh, which also deal with the case when m is equal to two. Uh, here, for this case, we need smooth boundary. Because the while asymptotics is a bit 
rough to determine how the eigenvalues behave. And you can show that the eigenvalues uh, for a constant which depends on dimension, uh, it is like j to the power 2m by d. So when m is equal to 1, this is classical Wiles asymptotics. This is known. When the Bilaplacian, you would expect the eigenvalues to be the square of the eigenvalues. So it should be like 4 by d in the bulk. But it's not entirely easy to prove the uh, Wiles asymptotics just so although the roughly our spectral theory would tell you that the eigenvalues would be square uh, on the bulk, but there are some boundary issues which kind of needs to be taken care. But thankfully the classical PD literature is kind of uh, much rich in this and they have these asymptotics. Now what you do is you take a CC infinity function and you define a rescaling of a weighted L2 norm. So what you do is so the sum over j, if this factor 1 by lambda j power s by 2 wasn't there, this is just a standard L2 norm. And uj is the eigenbasis of, uh, it's the orthonormal basis of L2. So this was the L2 norm. What you do is you introduce a weighted L2 norm. And you define the Sobolov spaces through this weighted L2 norm. So this is h s0 is just a closure of the C C infinity functions with this weighted L2 norms. And now to describe the limit, let us now look into, uh, so let us take these eigenvalues, lambda j, and take a square root of eigenvalues, and xj's are iid Gaussian, and uj's are the eigenfunctions. So you take a random series of this form. So your random series is just, so I'll keep a form, uh, summation of xj uj by square root of lambda j. Lambda j, we know how it behaves by the Wiles asymptotics. So one question is whether this series converges and where does this series converge? So now the series is, doesn't converge as a function. It converges as a distribution. So what one can show that if you take uh, S to be greater than such an exponent, then psi D exists, uh, exists in the space, the dual of this Sobolov space. So it's the negative, uh, negative index Sobolov space where, so it's a pure distribution. So the Sobolov spaces go like this, that you have, for example, H1, 0, D, then you have the L2, then you have H of minus 1, which is the dual of this. Similarly, like you have H2, 0, and then you have H of minus 2, like that. So till here you have the functions, and then you have pure distributions. So this turns out to be a pure distribution in that sense. So the result is that if you consider the membrane model on this blow up of uh, this set and if you rescale by h to the power d plus 4 by 2 and if you look at this psi h which uh, and you take test functions from here, then psi h converges in distribution to psi d. So, so when you, so this for example when you take the lambda from delta squared, so this turns out to be the continuum membrane model. This is the continuum membrane model. So psi h converges to the continuum membrane model in the space which is h of minus sd and this is the ugly expression for the exponent you get. Uh, I will not get uh, how to derive, I will not get to how to derive these ugly exponents. One thing like uh, it's not clear whether this is uh, in this setting we are doing whether this is the best exponent or not. At least in the DGFF case we tried to redo the computation and we saw that it's not the best exponent. Uh, but at least the Green's function uh, behavior or the solution behavior we have uh, that gives this exponent. Now the question is this is the membrane model. Can we extend a similar thing to other models? So, so for example if you take this model in general, and uh, so I'll talk about the dimension, and if you define the same thing, phi of x by h acting on fx uh, through this sum, and you take a scaling which is h power alpha, which will depend on the model you are taking, so what happens to this? So here are some of the answers. So kappa 1, kappa 2 are these uh, constants. Uh, kappa 1 is for the Laplacian, kappa 2 is for the bilaplacian. You have the scaling alpha, which is the scaling in the field. You have the space where your limit lives. 
uh, what is the limit and in which dimension you can show. This is the classical one. When you have just the Laplacian, you can redo a scaling by h power minus d by 2 by 2. You can show that the exponent s, uh, sd is 3 by 2. So for all s greater than s, uh, 3 by 2, the limit is Gaussian free field. That's expected. Like the discrete Gaussian free field would converge to the Gaussian free field. That's expected. In the continuum, when this part is not there, when you have Laplacian, I just talked about it that the limit is the membrane, and this is the ugly expression we had for the dimension. When you have both the things, so this was kind of a conjecture uh, in the sense that uh, after seeing many of the infinite volume behaviors, that when you have both the interaction at an equal proportion, the Laplacian dominates, and you have a DGFF. So you don't see the B Laplacian in the limit. So that gets canceled. And that's what happens that if you rescale things, you have a DGFF limit. Now when kappa 1 and kappa 2 depend on n. So here I have, for simplicity, I have taken this to be 1 and just this to be depending on n. So when kappa 2 depends on n and it is much, much greater than n square, it means kappa 2 divided by n square goes to infinity. Then you have a membrane coming up. So what is the difference in this result? That if you keep your constant coefficients, you have always the Gaussian free field dominating. If you make an n dependency, then you try to see that the membrane is slowly appearing in your model. So you have a membrane model. Now, if kappa is n less, than, less than n to the power half, uh, then you have again the GFF. So this includes the case, this one. So because 1 is less than n to the power, less than less than n to the power half, you have the DGFF. This we couldn't extend to n square. This is one place which we couldn't extend to n square. And when you have both the, so when you have that, this is similar to n square, you have a new operator, uh, new field arising out of the, both the Laplacian and the Laplacian square. So the mixed model kind of, you see both the things together in the space. So, uh, so here, like, what is missing is n square, and that's what we, like, we feel that that should be the case. And you will have a phase transition in n square behavior for the part two, that there are three models in three different regimes which come up as the limit. Okay, so I think I still have uh, five, six minutes or, uh, yeah. So what I'll do is, uh, Sorry for going fast, but yeah, anyway, like, any questions till now? No, 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 the regularity doesn't play a role here. I think what it plays is, uh, so, so when you write, what the thing which plays a role is when you consider the lattice 1 by h z d. So when you consider this rescale lattice, there is a 1 by h to the power 4. So what happens is, so uh, this also comes in the uh, while asymptotics also. If you see one is growing as j square, like uh, j, and another is going as j square in the critical dimensions. So somehow one of them beats the other. When you do a rescaling, one of them just beats other. If you add, for example, Laplacian 4 or Laplacian cube, if you go on adding, the Laplacian will still win until, unless you add something to compensate. That's what we are compensating with, like adding something more than n square to the in term. When you add an actor factor n square, you're compensating somehow the Weyl's asymptotics in that, so that like one beats the Weyl asymptotics there. Not in any, uh, not in any dimension. You see, if I take d is equal to 10, both brain GFF would have equal amount of roughness, almost equal amount. So it, it's a two degree regular, less regular than that, but it will be still a distribution which has, which looks very, very weird. So it will be, in smaller dimensions, you can tell, like two, three, uh, in dimension two and three, the GFF is like, it's a distribution, but uh, the membrane is a continuous function. So there is a classic qualitative difference in lower dimension, but in higher dimension, it will be almost similar. Yes. Yeah, but it's a, it's, a, it's a purely technical issue out of our method. It's a, uh, we feel like if one has a better method to do that, so it just fails because of our method, we feel. N square is a very special value. N square is a very special value. 
so yeah, uh, I can just roughly, so this is not correct, but what you get is in the rescaled lattice, if you look at delta uh, n plus, what you have is kappa 2 by n squared delta n squared. So, so this is kind of one of the factors which come in when you look at the scaling uh, in that case. So when you do, so what you have to do is, you have to do a Taylor series expansion of the, like the discrete operator should be close to the continuum elliptic operator. So when you do the closeness of the operator, it kind of, the second factor, there is a factor which comes in. And that's the Taylor series expansion which kind of fails there. So that's, that's purely the analytic reason why this is happening. Not, there is, uh, I don't have a physical reason here. That's why I believe that should be extendable by some other method. So here, so what happens as I was talking about, like what happens is uh, you have to look at the covariance structure. The covariance, once you consider the rescaled lattice, when you have lattice spacing to be h, there is a h power 4 which comes up and the Green's function satisfies this discrete equation. So the variance of the field can be written as, for example, if you just expand this, it's a Green's function acting on Fy, Fx. So what you do is club together this blue part, which is h power 4, gh, xy, fy, and call this h, h, xy. This h, h, h sub h, xy would be our main uh, thing. What, is hap what happens is this h, h, like solve the discrete Dirichlet. What you consider is a continuum Dirichlet, like this. So capital H solves the discrete Dirichlet. You consider U to be the continuum Dirichlet. And you look at the error between these two, the continuum and the discrete one. So what you're doing is you're just approximating the continuous solution by a discrete solution. And this is like uh, what we saw is like it's a big subject in numerical analysis where do people do finite element methods where uh, one can do approximation. And uh, so there was a beautiful paper by Tommy where kind of uh, amazing amount of uh, discrete Sobolov inequalities were generalized in this paper. Uh, uh, it's a kind of a Hilbert space theory paper. So what they show was, okay, so you have to adapt to that method. Uh, I'm just uh, going fast. You have to adapt to that method to show that the error is of the order of h to the power half. So what happens is you can replace the, so just going back to the variance format, so you can replace this by the continuum solution and do a Riemann sum. So all the effort goes in, so what you have is this converges to the continuum solution times fx, and the continuum solution can be written in terms of the Green's function times fy, and so the variance turns out to be this. So if you look at the variance of the series of this format, it turns out to be exactly that, and then you have the result. So all the effort goes in proving this error, uh, and this uh, thing which I was saying, like, what you have to do is, you have to approximate the discrete operator, the discrete elliptic operator with the continuum elliptic operator. So you have to do a Taylor series expansion, which is like, what happens is this discrete operator becomes consistent with the uh, elliptic operator here. And then, so, so when you are looking at the solution, you don't have the operators there. So you're looking at some Green's function, so you're looking at the solution ux. So you have to bring in the operator. And that is, way, that is a way which is classical that you have to go through Sobolov inequalities. Now bringing in the operator is the tricky one. So what happens is, first you have that the L2 norm of a function on the grid can be bounded by this discrete derivatives of the function. So that's a kind of standard Sobolov inequality. Then you have to define a truncated operator on the domain. So what you do is, you had the domain inside here. So you have to split it into three parts. One is which is quite inside. So the blue points are all the points whose two neighbors are belonging to itself. So if you take a point in the blue point, it will remain within the green and the blue region. And the green region is closer to the boundary. And this is exactly the, the orange ones are the places where the function is exactly zero. And so the RH I was taking, so you have to split it up into 
uh, two parts where the discrete operator is originally like the discrete operator in, in the inside. And on the boundary, you do a rescaling. Delta H squared, delta H fx on the boundary points. And what one can show that the original function, the L2 norm of the function, can be bounded by this delta truncated operator here. So this is a bit technical, but what I want to show is what is the difference between why people didn't get this and why this was in old result in numerical analysis is the idea that on the boundary, the function is very irregular. You cannot control the boundary. So what you do is a rescaling. And this, uh, just to show you the last picture, this works with boundaries where you can roll a ball. So uniform exterior ball condition, so that is kind of a uh, ugly condition which is needed uh, to roll the ball. Uh, finally, uh, those who are interested during lunch to see the open question, I will end here because I have finished my time. And thanks.